Okay, so let us begin with the homage to the Buddha. First, the day today is October 3rd, 2015. So we begin with homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Good morning everybody. Now, the weather changed just so quickly, so suddenly. Yeah. Just Last week, we were wondering, when is the summer ever going to be over? It's already the fall, and it seems like, you know, seems like we're in the middle of July, and now it seems we're in the middle of December. Okay, so today we will be taking sutta number 141 in the Majjhima Nikaya. I'm not omitting sutta number 140, but I won't get a chance to have another class until November 7th, because I'll be away for several weeks. And sutta number 140, it needs two classes, two successive classes. I don't want to break it up over one, you know, with several weeks omission. But one Sutta 141, we should be able to take in one class. Okay, so this Sutta is called the Satcha Vibhanga Sutta, which means the analysis, here it's translated the exposition of the truths. So I would render as an alternative for Vibhanga analysis. It means breaking down and explaining in detail. Okay, so this sutta begins when the Buddha, he's living in Benares at the Deer Park at Isi Patina. And so this is not taking place, if you know the history, the story of the Buddha, it was at Benares, at the Deer Park, that the Buddha gave his first sermon, setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma. But at that time, Sariputta and Moggallana were not yet his disciples, and yet they figure in this sutta. So this, must, this sutta must have taken place at a later time in the Buddha's teaching career, after he had been traveling, wandering to different places, preaching. And then along the way, then Sariputta and Moggallana encountered the Buddha, became his disciples, and now he's returned to the Deer Park. And so since the Deer Park was the site of his first discourse, now he's going to bring, refer to that discourse in this sutta. Okay, so he says here, the opening paragraph, he says, at at Benares, now it's called the Indian, the proper Indian word is Baranasi. Benares, I think, was the British way of pronouncing it. So at Baranasi, in the deer park at Isipatana, the Tathagata, the Arahant, the Samasambuddha, set in motion the matchless or unsurpassed wheel of the Dharma, the wheel that cannot be stopped, or pati pati it could also be rendered, cannot be turned back by any recluse or Brahmin or 
be it for God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. And so what is that setting in motion or turning, setting, rolling the wheel of the Dhamma? He says it's the announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of the Four Noble Truths. And so, of what four? And then this is a typical style of the suttas where a single phrase gets repeated with a number of terms, the variants within that group. So here it is the announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, and so forth of the noble truth of suffering, of the noble truth of the origin of suffering, of the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, of the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. <coughs> and so here we have the what's going to be the theme or topic of this discourse is the noble truths, the four noble truths. And so we have this expression Arya Satya. This is a compound of two words, the word Arya, which means noble, and the word Satya, which means truth. What kind of compound is it? No, it's not a Bahubi. <laughs> Any other ideas? Okay, it can be, it's actually several explanations of Arya Satya are given. One, we find these in the Satya Samyutta, that is the connected discourses on the Noble Truths. So one explanation is that these are the truths of the Aryan. This is of the Noble One. And in that sutta it said, in the world, the Tathagata is the Noble One. So these are the truths of the Noble One, the truths of the Buddha, the, taughts, the truths taught by the Buddha. So that's one way to explain the compound. And on that explanation, what kind of compound is it? No, no, you should know. Vanda? Vanda, no, no. Right, very good. Tapuri, so this is For example, table top, the top of the table is called the table top. So these are the truths of the noble one. Another explanation is that these are the truths for the noble ones. In this case, the word Arya refers not just to the Buddha, but to all of those who reach the noble paths and fruits. I think the explanation given is that the noble ones penetrate these, therefore they are called noble truths. So these are truths for the noble ones. You know, we ordinary people, for us, we accept them as truths, but we don't see them clearly, distinctively, as being truths. If we saw them as being truths, we would undergo a tremendous transformation of the mind. 
And so it's said that one doesn't really see the noble truths until one reaches the first of the four stages of realization, the stage of stream entry. That is, with that stage, one penetrates through wisdom and sees all four noble truths. Up until that point, we have, you might call this, a conceptual understanding of the truths, maybe some experiential <laughs> understanding of the first truth and the second truth. And we can see that there's suffering in life, and we can see that a lot of the suffering is due to our craving, but it is through the attainment, or it's by the attainment of the first stage of realization that one awakens to the Four Noble Truths as a whole. One then sees the Third Noble Truth. One sees directly that state which is the cessation of suffering, which is Nibbana, and one now sees through experience that the Noble Eightfold Path is the way to realize the cessation of suffering. And so we have, these are the truths of the Noble One, the truth, that is, the truths of the Buddha, the truths for the Noble Ones, the truth, in other words, the truths that are realized by the Noble Ones. And then another explanation that's given, and this supports the explanation is Kamadarya compound. These truths are noble. And the reason why they are noble is because it said, in Tatani Avi Tatani An Anyatani. That is, these truths, we say, are such, or these, these truths are actual, these truths are real, not. devoid of reality, not unactual. These truths are not otherwise, not otherwise than the truth, than truth. Okay, so the Buddha first announces or declares that his turning, setting in motion the wheel of Dhamma was just the announcement and the exposition or teaching of these Four Noble Truths. Then, with paragraph 5, there comes a little bit of a shift in the topic of the discourse. Suddenly he turns to the two disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana, and he says, cultivate the friendship of Sariputta and Moggallana. Associate with Sariputta and Moggallana. They are wise and helpful to their companions in the holy life. Okay, who were Sariputta and Moggallana? These were the two Agasavaka, the two chief disciples of the Buddha. It's said that all the Buddhas, all the fully enlightened ones, have two chief disciples who assist him in his work of propagating the Dharma. And Sariputta was the one who was designated by the Buddha the foremost in wisdom because he had this very penetrative insight and very extensive intellect. So when the Buddha could just teach something briefly, Sariputta would penetrate its many ramifications and, impl and implications. And then sometimes he would just take off from a short discourse by the Buddha, then elaborate it the theme in detail. 
And Moggallana had a different specialization. His specialty was what's called psychic powers, the iddis, the supernormal powers, powers to multiply the body and bring them back into one, the power to walk through <laughs> walls, the power to walk on water as though it were the earth, to dive in and out of the earth as though it were water, the power to fly through the sky. There's a power I just exercised a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> But the plane was a bit crowded. <laughs> and the great advantage of developing this, this power is that no luggage to check in, <laughs> no security checks to go through, you don't have to take off your shoes and put them in a basket and open up your computer. <laughs> and if you bring your toothpaste along with you in a little carry bag like this, there's no guard that's saying we have to take <laughs> take your toothpaste away. <laughs> okay, so there's a little background story to Sariputta and Moggallana. They were appointed, both were appointed the chief disciples of the Buddha, and both of them had been friends, even from boyhood. Their families apparently had been living in neighboring villages, and so they had been, the families had been friends. And when the two boys were ch children, they played <coughs> together as friends. And then when they reached the age of maturity, maybe early 20s, the age of so called age of reason, one day they went to this, it's called the Hilltop Festival. They, were, they grew up in the vicinity of Rajagaha, Rajgir. And there was this festival held every year called the Hilltop Vest Festival. So when they were some, someplace in their early 20s perhaps, they decided to go to see the Hillside Festival. And so the first day of the festival they went, they were enjoying themselves, Probably there have been dancers and musicians and acts and maybe acrobatics. And so they were really, you know, enjoying themselves, delighting in the festival. And so then they decided to buy tickets for the festival the next day. And so they went to the festival the next day. And as they were sitting there, the young Sariputta started to think, wow, all of these actors and dancers and musicians in a hundred years from now won't be here anymore. And we ourselves, a hundred years from now, won't be here anymore. Won't, won't be here anymore. So isn't this pointless? We enjoy ourselves, we delight, we amuse ourselves, but this is so impermanent. And so, you know, while they were sitting there, when the comedies came on, no laughter. When the acrobats came on, you know, leaping and walk, tightrope walking, they weren't looking up with their mouths open. But I just watched rather indifferent. And when they came out, Moggallana asked Sariputta, didn't you enjoy the festival today? And then Sariputta revealed what he was thinking. And Moggallana said, you know, I was thinking exactly the same thing. And he said, well, what do we do now? And these are young men who come from Brahmin families, Brahmin backgrounds where they're probably expected to continue the Brahmin lineage and perform all of the rites and rituals and ceremonies of the Brahmins. And so they said, what do we do now? 
And I think it was Moggallana said to Sariputta, the only course that's open to us, we should seek a path to the deathless. And so they left their home life and set out as wandering ascetics, traveling all over northern India, looking, you know, visiting different gurus and spiritual masters and teachers and yogis and philosophers, inquiring into their philosophies, practicing their systems of spiritual cultivation, but never really satisfied. And then one day, Sariputta was in a little village outside Rajagaha. He saw a monk named Asaji, who was one of the first five disciples of the Buddha. He saw this monk walking silently from house to house on his arms round, and he was so impressed by the demeanor of this monk, who was always seemed to be so calm and self-restrained. He saw that all of his actions were performed with mindfulness. He, mindfully, he would be walking from house to house, mindfully and quietly stopping in front of each house. If he would, people give an arm, give alms, he would recite a little blessing and then move on. And so he thought, if there's anybody in this world who's reached the goal, this one, this is the one who's done that. And so Sariputta, when he got the opportunity, he came to Asaji and said, please tell me what teaching you're following. And then Asaji said, I'm on my arm round now. This is not yet the time for answering questions. And so Sariputta then went, when he saw, he waited for Asaji to finish his arms round. Then he prepared a seat for him, offered him the seat, got some water for him, and waited for Asaji to finish his meal. Then when Asaji had finished, then Sariputta repeated his question. Then Asaji was very modest, so he said, I'm just a newcomer to this teaching. I don't really have an extensive knowledge of it. Um, and the teaching is very deep, it's very difficult for me to explain. But Sariputta said, it doesn't matter, just tell me whatever you know. And of course, Asaji was an Arahat at the time, but he was very modest, and so he re replied in this way. Then Asaji recited just a four-line stanza, a stanza which in time was to become engraved on Buddhist monuments all the ways from Afghanistan to you know, as far east as Indian Buddhism spread, as far south as Indian Buddhism spread, even Sri Lanka. The four-line stanza in Pali, Ye Dhamma Hetu Pabhava, Te Sang Hetum Tathagato Aha, Yo Cha Te Sang Cha Nirodo, E Vang Vadi, Mahasamano. <clears throat> Whatever dhammas, or things there are that originate from a cause, the Tathagata, the realized one, has explained the cause, and also that which is the cessation. That is what the great ascetic proclaims. And as soon as Sariputta heard this verse, he, right on the spot, he reached the first stage of enlightenment. His mental eye opened up and he penetrated the stage of stream entry and he saw that whatever arises, passes away. <clears throat> okay, then he asked Asachi, where is your teacher, the great sage, living now? And Asaji said, he's living at the bamboo grove. Please, you can come along with me. But Sariputta said, you go ahead first. I have to inform my friend. And so then Sariputta went 
to inform Moggallana. And as soon as Moggallana saw Sariputta coming, he realized that some great change had taken place in his friend. Now his face was so bright, his faculties seemed so clear. So Moggallana said, you've and so he said, you've got it, you've got it. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Then Sariputta told Moggallana the story of his encounter with Pasaji. And as soon as Sariputta recited the four-line verse, Moggallana also made that breakthrough and realized the truth. <clears throat> and then both of them decided to go off to the bamboo grove. And then when they met the Buddha, then the, well, when they came to the bamboo grove, the Buddha pointed in the distance that he told the monks, do you see those two young men coming, those two young ascetics? Those two will be my chief disciples. Okay, and then after they met the Buddha, then the Buddha ordained them or accepted them as monks. Then both of them went off to their own separate places in order to practice more intensely for the final goal. Moggallana, after seven days of striving, reached Arahatship. Sariputta took two weeks to reach Arahatship, not because he was more sluggish, not because his wisdom was more sluggish than that of Moggallana, but he was to become the chief disciple in wisdom and so he had to explore and investigate a much greater range of phenomena than Moggallana Moggallana did. Okay, so that's the background story to Sariputta and Moggallana. Okay, and now here we're coming back to the Sutta. The Buddha is urging the monks to cultivate the friendship of Sariputta and Moggallana. And then he compares them, he uses a similes to illustrate the way in which they're helpful. He says that Sariputta is like a mother, Moggallana is like a nurse. Sariputta trains others for the fruit of stream entry, Moggallana for the supreme goal, for the ultimate goal, the arahatship. I have to say, I find this a little puzzling. And I just wonder, when we have to do a little research into the text, to see whether there are cases where Sariputta trains his disciples to reach Arhat. It seems puzzling that he would just train them up to stream entry and then let them go. <clears throat> but I think the idea might be that once a person reaches stream entry, then they acquire the world-transcending Noble Eightfold Path. <clears throat> and so they, the path then becomes sort of an integral part of their, say, their mental equipment. So they don't need any, in a sense, they don't need any further instruction to reveal to them the truths that have to be understood. All they need would be guidance in practice so that they would know how to practice in order to make progress more rapidly. But once you reach the stage of stream entry, you've seen the Dhamma, you've seen the truth, then it's a matter of, even if one is very lazy after that, one is bound to reach the final goal in seven more lives. So maybe Sariputta wanted to instruct a greater number of pupils. And so he would instruct a batch of pupils when they reach stream entry, let them cultivate on their own, then take on a new batch. Whereas Moggallana would take the smaller, would work with a smaller group, but instruct them until they reach Arhatship. But still, I have to say, it seems a bit strange to me. Okay, then the Buddha says, Sariputta is able to announce, teach, describe, establish, reveal, expound, and exhibit the four noble truths. Okay, then the Buddha, after saying this, then 
he sort of dropped a hint there, and then he gets up and goes into his into his kudi, his dwelling place, and shuts the door. So this gives the opening for Sariputta to expound in detail the Four Noble Truths. Okay, so Sariputta addresses the monks. He repeats the first part of the Buddha, he repeats the Buddha's sayings that the wheel of Dharma taught by the Buddha at Benares was the Four Noble Truths. And now he's going to explain each of these noble truths. Okay, so let us look at these passages. You know, often we take, almost we take the four noble truths for granted. You know, like this is call it basic Buddhism, elementary Buddhism, introductory Buddhism, Buddhism 101. If you look at Walpula Rahula's famous book, popular book, what the Buddha taught, what is the sort of framework of the book, Four Noble Truths. Venpul Piyadasi's, the Buddha's ancient path, framework, Four Noble Truths, but more elaborate explanation of the eight factors of the path. If you look at college textbooks on world religions, what is the teaching of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths. But we look at the way the Buddha teaches. Let's take example sutta number 56. This is page 485, paragraph number 18. Okay, then the Blessed One gave the householder Upali progressive instruction, that is, talk on giving, it's generosity, talk on virtue, it's sila, good behavior, behavior that conforms to the precepts, to the ways of wholesome action, talk on the heavens, probably this would be actually more than the heavens, but on the different realms of existence, the types of karma that lead to the different, to rebirth into the different realms. Then he explains the danger, degradation and defilement in sensual pleasures and the blessing of renunciation. When he knew that the householder Upali's mind was ready, receptive, free from hindrances, elated and confident. Then he expounded to him the teachings special to the Buddhas, suffering its origin, its cessation, and the path. So you see, the Buddha doesn't begin, unlike <laughs> Valpada Rahula, Benvolpia Dasi, the college textbook on Buddhism. And then there's a popular C CD that's been spreading around, maybe some of you have heard it. It's called The Buddha's Teaching As It Is, I think. It was done by some monk who was living in the Washington Buddhist Vihara back in the 19, early 1980s. <laughs> So it starts off, I think, the first lecture is on the life of the Buddha. The second one is on the Four Noble Truths. You know, so the Four Noble Truths is not Buddhism 101. And what happens when the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths? As 485 continues, as the passage continues on page 485, Okay, just as a clean cloth with all marks removed would take the dye evenly, so too, while the householder Upali sat there, the spotless immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in him. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. 
Then the householder Upali saw the Dhamma, attained the Dhamma, understood the Dhamma, fathomed the Dhamma. He crossed beyond doubt. He did away with perplexity. He gained intrepidity and he became independent of others in the teachers. Here, the translator uses what I call singlish. This is Sri Lankan English, Singhalese English, dispensation, but it really means the teaching. Let's say he became independent of others in the teacher's teaching. So with this, he what this, all of these statements are indicating is that as he heard the Four Noble Truths, he gained that vision of Dhamma, he saw the truth, the ultimate truth of the Buddha's teaching. He cut off the first three fetters binding to samsara, and he's now on the irreversible path to liberation. In a, what does he say? <laughs> What does he do? He says to the Blessed One, Now, Venerable Sir, we, are, <laughs> we must go. We are busy and have much to do. <laughs> now, this is like he's stepped onto the, you know, he's stepped onto the path that's bringing an, <laughs> an end to his cycling in the wheel of birth and death. <laughs> And instead of saying to the Buddha, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but my wife is waiting for me. And I, have to, I have to drive to pick up the kids from school and bring them home. <laughs> and as a wealthy householder, I have to pay the servants. Okay, so the Four Noble Truths are those truths which, when they're taught by an enlightened one, they bring that breakthrough to realization. Okay, so now we have the noble truth of suffering. Again, we come across this problem with words that are English translations that are always unsatisfactory or inadequate to render a Pali word. So yeah, I think you all know the Pali word itself, which is dukkha. There are a number of popular etymologies of the word which I think are intended playfully or in an edifying sense rather than to be taken literal, as literal explanations. I remember a couple of weeks ago somebody raised the question whether dukkha means, how do they put it, an axle that is not properly fit, fitted. Another explanation is from what is difficult to endure. This is based on endure, the prefix plus, I think, kanti, patience or endurance. So if you take the ka from kanti and join it to dur, it becomes what's hard to endure. But the word dukkha was used in the Buddha's time pretty much in a literal sense to indicate what is, what is painful, whatever is painful. But the Buddha took it and gave it a wider and deeper meaning to indicate whatever is, sometimes the explanation, unsatisfactory, whatever is inadequate, whatever is flawed, defective, the potential cause of suffering. Okay, so here, rather than give an explanation, Sariputta, following the Buddha's own account in the first sermon, just enumerates the different modes or aspects of dukkha, that birth is dukkha, old age is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha, not to obtain what one wants is dukkha, in short, 
the five aggregates here he has affected by clinging or I would put subject to clinging where the five aggregates bound up with clinging are dukkha okay this much is just echoing or repeating the Buddha's exposition in the first discourse but now what becomes what makes a sutta an analysis of the truths is that we're going to have explanations of each of these terms. Okay, so what is birth? And here we have the birth of beings into the various orders of beings. They're coming to birth. Their entry into the womb the generation or production, the manifestation of the aggregates, of the five aggregates, and obtaining the basis for contact. This is called birth. Actually, technically, from the Buddha's perspective, what we call jati or birth would be conception rather than emerging from the womb. So when a current of consciousness coming from a being that's passed away unites with a fertilized ovum to start a new existence that is birth when that union takes place of the consciousness the stream of consciousness with the ovum then the five aggregates arise so that's the manifestation of the aggregates and the first sense bases are required at the initial moment of conception, there will just be the body base. No, the sense bases are, or bases for contact are, are eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So at the moment of conception, there's just the body base and the mind base. Then as the cell divides and subdivides and divides over and over, <coughs> then the eye, ear, nose, and tongue start to appear until we have the being with six sense bases, with all six sense faculties. Okay, then we have aging, described very visibly. Okay, they're old, the aging of beings and the various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, the graying of the hair, which we can now disguise by dyeing the hair, wrinkling of the skin, the decline of vitality, weakness or of the faculties, so that the eyes are no longer as acute as in the past. Hearing gets weak. Taste buds no longer as sensitive as they were. So this is aging and then we have death. This is the passing of beings out of the various orders of beings. They're passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time, the breakup of the aggregates the laying down of the body, this is called death. <clears throat> okay, then we have definitions of the terms, the other terms used to, in elaborating on dukkha, sorrow, lamentation. These are just explained by way of, mostly by way of synonyms. Then we come to pain, which is here explained as bodily pain. And then we have, and the word translated as pain here is again dukkha. So this is one type of dukkha within the truth of dukkha. So the truth of dukkha is, has a very broad meaning, encompassing all the many unsatisfactory or <coughs> undesirable aspects of existence. Whereas, in this list of terms, the word dukkha refers specifically to painful bodily feeling. 
Then the word translated here is grief, I think not so satisfactory. It's dominasa, which is simply mental painful feeling or mental discomfort. The uncomfortable feeling born of mental contact. So grief is too strong a word. This can include any kind of, say, sadness, displeasure, uneasiness, vexation of the mind. Then we have this, what's translated as despair, I think not so satisfactory. Upayasa, we could say is maybe misery is better. So it's just that extreme misery of the mind that occurs when one encounters some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. Okay, then we come to the dukkha or unsatisfactoriness of not to obtain what one wants, not to obtain what one wants is suffering. And here one would think you would get the explanation that somebody wants wealth, fame, power, position, not to get that is suffering. Of course that would be included here, but the explanation that's given is interesting. To being subject to birth, there comes the wish, oh, that we were not subject to birth. But this is not to be obtained by wishing, and so not to obtain what one wants is suffering. Then the same pattern is repeated in regard to aging, sickness, death, and also to sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So, wishing to avoid these unsatisfactory states, being unable to do so, this is also dukkha. Okay, then we come to a rather tricky point. This is, what are the five aggregates, panchupadana kanda? I'll show you from the Pali why this is a problematic term. So the Pali term is panch upadhana kanda. So pancha means five, upadhana is clinging, and kanda are the aggregates. And so one would hope to see an explanation what is actually meant by calling these upadhana kanda, clinging aggregates. But in the sutta, and pretty much this is the case in all of the suttas, you get what are the five aggregates, the panchupadana kanda. So here we have, they are the material form aggregate, subject to clinging, the feeling aggregate, perception aggregate, volitional formations aggregate, the consciousness aggregate, subject to or affected by clinging. These are the five clinging aggregates, translating it literally. So what's meant by calling them upadhana kanda, clinging aggregates? Like one, some people interpret this to mean that the five aggregates themselves are types of clinging. But that can't be the case. The form aggregate doesn't do any clinging. 
feeling aggregate doesn't do any clinging. And when we inquire what is actually meant by clinging, clinging is a kind of desire, attachment. So where is the attachment in the five aggregates? It's a test question, not a rhetorical question. Excuse me? I'm not asking for an explanation of clinging, but where in the five aggregates are they? Exactly. What's meant by clinging is attachment, desire, and attachment. So amongst the five aggregates is to be found in the aggregate of mental formations. And there's an interesting passage that occurs in Sutta 44, I think. And also, but coming from the Buddha's own word, I think the same passage comes in 109. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, yeah, it's on page 887. Yeah, on a full moon night, a monk is questioning the Buddha. Okay, so in paragraph six, this is on the bottom of page 887 in my edition, the monk says, is that clinging the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging or subject to clinging? Or is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging, subject to clinging? Then the Buddha says that cling, on page 888, that clinging is neither the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging, nor is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging. So the five aggregates as a whole are, the, are not clinging themselves. <clears throat> but the clinging is something is not something apart from the five aggregates, so that we have the five aggregates here and clinging over here. But the Buddha says it is the desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates affected by clinging that is the clinging there. So in other words, it's these, the clinging is something within the five aggregates, and we would locate it in the aggregate of the mental formations, or volitional formations. So it's that desire and lust, desire and attachment, through which one holds on to the five aggregates, particularly holding to them in the, with the idea that these are mine, this is I, this is myself. Okay, so then Sariputta says, this is called the noble truth of suffering, dukkha, before we move on, maybe at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions, anything on anything that's come up so far. No questions. Okay, so then we should move on. <coughs> Okay. 
Oh, please, good, yeah. If, if you would take the microphone. Thanks. Um, when the Buddha refers to the five aggregates of clinging, do they usually just refer to, say, the material form aggregates? Does this usually just refer to our physical body, or does it refer to any material form whatsoever, like the table or the... <laughs> <coughs> just looking in the sutta that you just referenced, 109, um, the, the bhikkhu asks, um, you know, what is the... Uh, what was it? Oh, in what way does the term aggregates apply to the ant? Yeah. yeah. And he says, um, any kind of material form, whatever, past, future, present, internal, external, you know, and so on. Yeah, but well, it's it also includes external material form, also external feelings, perceptions, volitions, consciousness. Because I could cling to. <clears throat> I'm getting this from in my. <clears throat> I, I could cling to material thing, to inanimate material objects. I wouldn't be so inclined to cling to the table, but if somebody, Johnny comes up, or somebody comes in through the back door here while I'm look, facing the audience and grabs this iPad, this is the iPhone, the iPhone, then I'm certainly going to, the clinging is going to become quite evident. <laughs> and then I, <coughs> seems a little strange that I'm clinging to the feelings, perceptions of others, or at least I cling to other people. So that's clinging to, to the, the five aggregates that constitute their being. Right. That makes sense, but it was just a little different than what I had been thinking of it as. I usually thought of material form as being just my body. No, no, it's internal and external. Okay, let us go on now to the noble truth of the origin of dukkha. And so, what is the noble truth of the origin of dukkha? Okay, it is craving which brings, here the text uses a word, pono babika. which comes from puna, which means again, and bhava means existence, not in the abstract sense of existence, but existence as a specific mode of sentient existence. So puna bhava is literally again existence or repeated existence. And craving is called pono bhavika. See if the feminine. Tanha is feminine. Craving is called pono bhavika because craving it is what is responsible for renewed existence, for repeated existence. We see this underscored in Sutta number 43. Let me see if I could find the exact page. Yeah, this is page 390. There's a sub the subheading called being. Though I prefer, this is buffer, I actually prefer existence. Okay, so this is a dialogue between Sariputta and another monk, Mahakotita. So the one asked the question, how many kinds of being or existence are there? Then the reply is, there are three kinds of being. Sense fear, 
existence, fine material existence, and immaterial existence. So those are the three realms of existence, according to the Buddhist, cos Buddhist cosmology. Then he asks, how is renewal of being, or punubhava, generated? How is future renewal of being generated? Then he says, renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So in other words, the repeated existence Existence within the samsara, the round of repeated birth and death, is generated. The sort of underlying roots of this process are ignorance and craving. And it's because ignorance obscures the nature of things that we have the craving to go on. And the craving manifests in delighting in this and that. And then we'll find that in the same definition of the second noble truth. So, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, it is craving which brings renewal of being or repeated existence and is accompanied by delight in, and lust and delights in this and that. That is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, and then the puzzling one in the set is the craving for non-being, for non-existence. So it's obvious to us, more ob most obvious, is craving for sensual pleasures. But at a deeper level, there's the craving to go on in existence. And perhaps this exists in the form, or this craving for existence can exist in the form of just this raw clinging to life. But in the, I think the Buddhist framework, it takes a more sublimated form of the desire to be reborn into the heavenly realms, the Brahma realms. And so the spiritual seekers, like the yogis and sannyasis of the time, were seeking in the Brahmins the rebirth in the Brahma realm to continue on in the Brahma realm. And then comes the craving for non existence. And I think that's something other than simply the desire that somebody that drives somebody to commit suicide. But I think underlying this is a philosophical idea that death marks the complete end of existence. When one dies, when the body dies, that's the end of everything. And so that is seen for the Buddha as a manifestation, that belief, of a craving for everything to come to an end at death. But what the Buddha teaches is that as long as the causes of renewed existence remain operative, as long as there is ignorance and craving, the round will go on. And I think this explanation is quite instructive, especially for some of what our new, <laughs> newly formulated Western Buddhism, like we accept the Four Noble Truths, but we're clearing away everything but the old Indian cultural baggage that Buddhism brings along, including karma and rebirth. We just take the Four Noble Truths but if you see how the Four Noble Truths are explained, the Second Noble Truth, craving that leads to renewed existence. <laughs> okay, then comes the Third Noble Truth. This is the Noble Truth of the cessation of suffering. And this, the way I would interpret it, there are two levels to this. So first, look at the definition. It is the remainderless fading away and ceasing the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, and rejecting of that same craving. This is the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha. Okay, at one level, we could speak of this as a kind of 
maybe the psych, what I would call the psychological cessation of dukkha. That is, as long as we have craving, then we experience some degree of unhappiness, unsatisfactoriness, uh, displeasure, and worry, stress in our lives. And when we give up that craving, then we become free from stress, worry, concern, anxiety, displeasure, misery, and so on. So that's the psychological understanding. But the deeper level of understanding is that when one gives up craving, that means the end of the dukkha of the round of birth and death. So that is, the third book, Noble Truth, is actually the release, the ultimate release from bondage to the cycle of birth and death. Okay, then we come to, I'll try to go rather quickly through the path, <laughs> since we only have about 15 minutes left, and I want to leave a little time for questions. So what is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of dukkha? So it's the noble eightfold path, from right view to right concentration. Then we come to, here we have like formal definitions of each of the path factors. Okay, so what is right view? So here we have knowledge or understanding of dukkha, its origin, its cessation, and the path. And what's interesting, here we have the Four Noble Truths. Let me see if I could diagram this. So within the Four Noble Truths, we have the fourth truth is the Noble Eightfold Path. Then the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is right view. And what is right view but understanding the Four Noble Truths? And that implies understanding the fourth Noble Truth, which is the um, Noble Eightfold Path. And that would mean understanding. <laughs> understanding right view as the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it would seem that you could just go on, you know, repeating this ad infinitum. It's a little bit like when I was a boy, my parents had bought me this hat, and the hat had a label inside which showed a little boy wearing the same kind of hat. And I thought, that little boy is wearing the same kind of hat, and the hat that he's wearing has a label with a little boy wearing the same kind of hat. <laughs> I think that was my first encounter with the mathematics of infinity. <laughs> I thought, well, that boy must be... <laughs> And I think I sat down there trying to figure out, well, how do we come to an end? <laughs> Where do I get the last label without a little boy? 
And my mommy called me and said, come, we have to get the subway train. <laughs> okay, so notice that the Noble Eightfold Path begins with right view, even in our day-to-day -day life, in practicing the Noble Eightfold Path for all the other factors to really become path factors, components of the path leading to the cessation of dukkha. They have to be preceded and guided by right view. Therefore, the Buddha calls right view Pubangama, the forerunner of the path. Okay, then right view Again, it has different levels. There's what I would call conceptual understanding as right view. Then the right view that develops through insight meditation as one starts to see into especially the truth of dukkha and its relation to craving. And then there comes, so there's conceptual right view, the right view of insight, and then there is the right view of the world transcending path. That is when insight reaches its maturity or culmination. Then there arises the penetrative insight into all four noble truths. And that is the noble right view, which is the right view of the stream and truth. And that right view then is what clears the way to reaching the goal of the path. But in the ordinary practice and day-to-day -day life, right view gives rise to right intention. Here explained is the intention. Renunciation, or now I would say simply desirelessness. Intention of non-ill will, intention of non-cruelty, or harmlessness. So when we have the right view, this will affect our intentions or motivations. So when we understand the truth of dukkha, say for ourselves, that will motivate us to give up the strong attachment which causes this suffering. And when we understand that dukkha applies to others, that will help to counter ill will and harmful behavior or the intention of harming others. Okay, then right intention translates in action into right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So those three make up what are called the morality or ethics group within the Noble Eightfold Path. And what could have right speech, right action, right livelihood outside the Noble Eightfold Path, you know, so that they are not exclusive to the Buddha's teaching, but for them to be functioning as factors of the path to the cessation of dukkha. They have to be guided and led by right view. Okay, then, with right effort, we come to the side of the path, the factors of the path that constitute mental training. So here we have right effort, which is the effort to remove unwholesome states of mind, and to prevent unwholesome states of mind from arising, the effort to arouse wholesome states of mind, and then to maintain, stabilize, and develop those wholesome states of mind. And in the context of meditation practice, right effort goes together with right mindfulness. So we can say that mental cultivation is so the interplay of right effort and right mindfulness, or right effort devoted to cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness. And then when this right effort applied to the four foundations of mindfulness reaches maturity, then comes the eighth factor of the path, right concentration, which is explained by the formula for the four jhanas, the four meditative absorptions.
Okay, and then this is called the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. And then Sariputta wraps up the discourse by saying, at Benares, in the deer park, at Asipatana, the Tathagata, the Arahat, the fully enlightened one, set in motion the matchless wheel of the Dharma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin, etc., or anyone in the world. That is the announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of these Four Noble Truths. And that takes us to the end of the discourse. And so, if there's any questions, then please feel welcome to us. Okay, Nelia and then Ravi. <coughs> The question I have is on page 252, where it says, I put away the covenant and the grief for the world. What does grief for the world mean? It's in the bottom. On which page? Page um, 1100. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, this is. Inaya loke abhicha domanasa. Okay, so here, we, again, what's called, what's translated here as grief is the Pali word domanasa, which grief, I think, is not a satisfactory tra translation of that. This comes from, is a word, manas, which means mind. And then we have this prefix, dur, again, which means dur usually implies anything bad, unsatisfactory. So to form, so there's a word, dumino. Which means sad, somebody is sad or unhappy, it's domino. And so dominasa, this is the abstract noun based on that. So dominasa is sadness, displeasure. And so abhija is strong desire. Dominasa is sadness. So those are the kind of way to group the kinds of emotions that arise when somebody goes into seclusion to develop meditation practice. Sometimes there come thoughts of desire, attachment to this, to that. Other times there come things, ideas or thoughts that cause displeasure, dissatisfaction, ill will, sadness. And so as these arise in the course of one's development of the four foundations of mindfulness, one has to put away these kinds of thoughts as they arise and just keep the mind grounded in the meditation object amongst the, whatever it is, amongst the four foundations of mindfulness. Does that make it clear? Okay, and then Ravi came next. Ante, uh, I think you explained part of it, the Nankar Kedi, the Anche Yeah. Uh, isn't that also part of right view? And it should mean that probably the right view the noble right view, which is part of that, but you mentioned the noble right Yeah, I mean, uh, when one is developing the right view of insight, then it would be seeing into impermanence, <coughs> dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. Yeah, so that would come in the right view of insight. The sort of, you could say that those three characteristics are elaborations of the first noble truth, the truth of dukkha. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bhante, um, I was pondering the question when Charles Kuka first heard um, 
um, the four noble truths, and he immediately became a stream interpreter. Yeah. Um, what makes, well, what, what enables a person um, to attain that level of understanding immediately versus another person who doesn't? <laughs> and then you mentioned the fact that right view, an increasing right view, an improving right view, particularly the super mundane, will ultimately lead you to stream enter. So how do you develop that? Or hmm. how do you attain increasing right yeah. view? Yeah. Well, in the case of Sariputta, but in the case of not only Sariputta, but we hear, we read many places in the suttas, the Buddha or some eminent monk is giving a discourse and then the disciple who's listening, just while they're sitting there, it seems that from the account, even the lay person like Upali that I referred to, you know, he had been a follower of the Jains actually before he met the Buddha. As soon as they hear the discourse, the breakthrough takes place. And the suttas themselves don't give any explanation of what is the background to their attainment. And so we find this information comes like usually in the commentaries. In the case of Sariputta, it said that Sariputta had encountered a previous, <laughs> previous Buddha many aeons in the past, and he had made a aspiration or a vow to become the chief disciple of the Buddha. And then over many, many lives, he develops a set of qualities that are called paramis or paramitas. And this is something of a puzzle to me. I don't know how to figure this out. The suttas themselves don't speak about the developments that take place in previous lives that lead to one to realization in this lifetime. And it's just a question for me. Why is this all that, why isn't this included? And then it's explained in the commentaries, and so if one wants to take like a critical perspective, one says, and say, well, the commentaries are later works. They come from you know, over the centuries after the passing away of the Buddha. And yet the only way I could understand how these sudden breakthroughs could take place is that somebody has been practicing developing the path and developing those qualities needed for realization over many lives. So it's just like, you compare it just like, lotus, in fact the suttas use a simile, it's like the lotus flowers on the surface of the pond, is all they need is for the sun to rise and when the sun rises then they open up and blossom. And so the lotus flower has gone through this whole process of, you know, germinating and then coming up through the pond, coming to the surface of the pond. And so it's gone through maybe months of growth and it's just the appearance of the sun that causes them to open up. And so I would say that that process of growth of the lotus flower is like our own practice of these qualities that call them paramis, paramitas. Thank you. I think we'll have a break now for the lunch, and then we can come back here, say 12.15, and have some discussion. Okay, so let us end with the sharing of the merits. And so we share the merits with the devas, the dhamma-protecting deities, the buddhas, the fair spirits, and with all beings, asking them to rejoice in the merits, to protect the Dhamma, to protect the world. Akasa ta jabhuma ta deva naga mahidika punyanta nanumo dipa chirang rakantu sasana. Akasa ta jabhuma ta deva naga mahidika punyanta nanumo dipa Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasa Ta Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumo Deepa Chirang Rakantu Mamparam Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Devanumo Dantu 
Sapa Sampati Siddhya He Tapata Chum He He Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sapa Bhutanamo Dantu Sapa Sampati Siddhya He Tapata Chum He He Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sapa Satanamo Dantu Sapa Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Avijita To E tantare satakaya papana rupia rupicha sanya sanino dukkha pamochantu pusantu nibhutin. Okay, we end with three half bows to the Buddha.